On the big interview, we've had many uh, coaches that we respect and love and whose work has made us happy over the years. And in the case of, particularly in the case of Manuel Pellegrini, who we have today, your work at Villarreal and Malaga at Betis, you've done other spectacular work. Before I knew what you were like in Chile and Argentina and Ecuador at Manchester City. But as a guy who's been living in Spain for 21 years, first of all, thank you for all the spectacular football I've watched. Thank you for joining the big interview. It's kind of you. Thank you. Yes. The reason that we've asked you here today is that we want to um, understand a bit more about you and, and your ideas. And Manuel, one of the strangest stories I think that I've heard about your background is the importance and the impact of going from South America to Lillisol in 1988. Now, I'll explain to you, we're, we're within touching distance of the Benita Villa Marine, my second stadium in Spain in 1982. We came to the World Cup and a guy called Alex Ferguson, who was our neighbour in Aberdeen, got us tickets and took us out to dinner and he was our, our chaperone in 1982. Mm -hmm. And he coached my team, Aberdeen, for many years before Manchester United. And I remember seeing you in the UEFA Elite Coaches Forum. And at the lunchtime, you'd come from an interview. And I saw Alex Ferguson holding one chair for you and, and shooing away <laughs> Rafa Benitez or Mourinho. I don't know. No, no. This one is for Manuel Perry. <laughs> one, let's talk about the effect that Alex Ferguson, um, your battles with him have had, your friendship with him. But you went to Lillisol in 1988 to, to learn, and how did, you, how did you get there? I will try to explain so many years ago, but... Uh, well, well, I was a professional football player for around 15 years in Chile. And also I studied in the university, an engineer. I studied six years in the university. And I always thought that when I finished my career as a football player, I was going to continue working in Geneva, not in football. But uh, I knew a famous Chilean coach, that his name is Fernando Riera, that he started a little bit trying to me to continue my career after the, after the player as a manager. So listen to him I, with a friend of mine, Arturo Salas, that also is a very famous uh, manager in Chile, that has a lot of different works. We started going to different countries. First, in 985, we went to Coachano. In Italy, in, Italy, in Florence, yes, which is the Italian FA Center of Excellence, exactly, right? Exactly. After that, we went to French, also to another course in Lille, and, uh, and was the option to come here to lille -Sol. And uh, we sent all our papers, and uh, it was an international course, so they uh, accept us, and we came here. And uh, in that, uh, in, that uh, in that year, 988, yes, yes, 88. Sir Alex Ferguson was just starting working with Manchester United. Correct. He came from Aberdeen, from uh, Scotland, a lot of here. And when well, he made a session, a work session with Manchester United and during the course. So it was the first time that I saw him. And after that, before I, to that meeting in, in, in UEFA in Zurich, well, we played against Villarreal four times with, with that Manchester, and the fourth time was nil to nil <laughs> in Manchester and in Villarreal. So, well, in that moment, I always talked with him after the, after the game that so many times in, in England that I think it's, it's a, good old, a good option to do it. Both managers talk after the match uh, with a cup of wine or, or with a... It's a nice tradition. Yes, a nice tradition that I think that it must continue in, the, in our way. But, well, I started knowing him in that moment, and after that, well, playing championship. We before the champion start every year, and I have the option to play play seven times the, the champion. That meeting of the different managers in in Zurich, well, uh, I continue working and, and talking with him. Maybe you don't remember exactly the course that Sir Alex put on in 1988. I'll, I'll accept <laughs> this, but I guess you went to the old training ground, the Cliff. Um, but between that course and Lillisol, what did you learn? Because to, to cross the Atlantic, to go to Italy, to France and then England, I imagine that there must have been very significant... And what people don't know is that you were coaching then and the club that you were coaching still had four games to go and you went to do the training course 
while the season was still alive. So there must have been an idea that something very that that you could learn something extremely special. What did you learn in that trip to Lillysol? Well, a lot of different uh, different things. First of all, to working in small sites, the pitches during the, the whole way there. Maybe I, I'm talking you in that uh, 188, 85. You normally the week in the way you program the week was is so different that today that. But it was the first time that I saw the training in a, in a small space reduction. So re re games reduce, in reduced spaces to, in reduced space. to make the, the players play? To make the players in the small, small, uh, small place to touch, to play one or two touch. So that's a lot of possession in, in small sites, uh, pitches also. Well, I think that was the, the most thing that I learned in that, in that course, in the way that... Because in that moment in South America, you always work, always with a complete pitch. Maybe a normal week in South America in that moment was a Tuesday, you work most of the physical work. A Wednesday, you work physical work with some technical work. Thursday, you, do, you always do 90 minutes in the whole pitch. A Friday, you reduce a little bit the charge, and well, Saturday or Sunday, you play. But Normally, in that moment, you always did 90 minutes in the, in the, big, in the complete pitch. And then, I mean, South, Africa, South America is a huge continent, but in general, or in Chile, Argentina, was the football maybe more technical and more on the floor, but slower? Yes, yes, slower, more technical, without any doubt. Uh, in that moment, also here in England, the, the football was always box to box <laughs> yes. as soon as you arrive to the, the other box and, uh, and the most amount of crosses you can do or, or, or goalkeeper kick from, from box it's, to box it's only just changing in the last few years no, from 1988 no, no, the no, last no. few years no 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 I think that changed a lot when Arsene Wenger arrives to England the, he brought with him four or five French players with technical players and I think that also Alex Ferguson that in that moment dominate absolutely the English football with Manchester United. He saw that Arsenal was winning also the FA Cup with another football and I think that he made a little bit, not completely changed, but the football in England uh, mix a lot. To adapt a little bit? No, I don't know if the, if the, the word is adapt. It's, I think that he, he mixed the both, both football. Mm -hmm. both. Uh, because well, Arsene Wenger started winning the the, the the Premier League, he makes brilliant uh, season with uh, with Arsenal. I think that all was uh, England in the way that they couldn't win the Champions League. They saw another teams, uh, maybe Barcelona or Real Madrid, that were technical players. To recover the ball was not so easy. I think that that moment in England. To, you don't need to work to recover the ball. You don't need to pressure for the ball because you always play directly. All the teams throw the ball as soon as they can to put it in point inside the box of the other team. And when you arrive to Europe and you try and the, the other team start one, four, five, ten, eight times uh, touching, 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 you can't, uh, you cannot get the ball. Uh, so I think that was a change in England football that now is a mix of both football. And that's why I think that they improve a lot. But in, in 88, for sure, in England, the ball was mostly still being played Absolutely. quite long. Absolutely. All balls long. I remember that after I finished that course, I went to see the final of the FA Cup. I think that was Queen Park Rangers against... Tottenham Hotspur? Queen Park Rangers. I think that was you know, Manchester United or on a, with, a, well, uh, with the, the, the pitch with a lot of mud. Yeah. And the ball directly from the goalkeeper. The goalkeeper threw the ball three or four, five meters in front of him, and nobody comes to <laughs> to, to disturb him to, to to kick that ball. Uh, it seems crazy now. I think that now it's impossible to play that football. <laughs> it was impossible after first with the Premier League because yeah. the Premier League started in ninety two, ninety three, and all the pitches were the best pitches of the world. I remember going to when I moved down to England to work. I remember going to a football exhibition at Wembley. So we're talking maybe about 95, 96. And Rud Hullett was there then, either just joining Chelsea or maybe already player boss of Chelsea. And he was funny. He stood up in front of a big auditorium and he said, I've always loved English football. Because when we played against you for Holland or AC Milan, 
I didn't stay in the midfield of the attack. I went back to stand next to the centre house. I waited for the ball oh. to come in the air. I took it down on my chest, and then we began to play. Thank you very much. Oh. Which was a great way to take the piss out of English football. But okay. there was a, a, a breakdown of the ideas of continental Europe and England. Therefore, the log Manuel, the logical thing to ask you is, although you had a spirit of adventure and learning, you always have had a spirit of learning, in 1988, why England? And why did you discover an interesting thing about working tight in small spaces in the coaching area when the league was still playing completely differently? To, to me, it's an interesting <laughs> thing you discovered. Yes, but I don't know why. Really don't know. Why I came to Lidl Because I went to France, to Italy and to England and I made also the course in Chile. I wanted to know different ways of what football was in those different countries. How, but even then, could you watch English league football in Chile? Yes, we watched it not too much, not too much, but uh, we saw where the better course, in uh, international course in Europe and we came here. So, but, but uh, at the same way, I came to England, I also went to Italy and to France. It was different ways. Italy was... Uh, absolutely different international course was all the course in England all the, the complete course where, where you working as a manager okay in England you were always listen a manager in the way you must work but you never practice in the pitch just talk 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 just as, as you in university you were knew about tactical football and defending football uh, was uh, also for me very useful in my, my career also the college channel but it were absolutely three different ways to see what football in that moment was. And am I right in thinking that this spirit of learning, spirit of adventure, comes from, apart from your determination to be excellent, comes from your parents? You, did you grow up in a family which said, read a lot, learn a lot, try to develop yourself? Yes, absolutely. One of the, I, I, I think that one of the most important things when you are a small boy and a child is what your father demands from you. And I had to, my father, that was a very workman, that he studied by himself. Uh, he didn't went to the university, he finished the school, and he started working for himself about building, construction. And he had, a, after that, a, a 20 or 30 years with a very good office. And my mother, my mother that was always reading, <laughs> what she can do, well, she always also speaks English, French, uh, and uh, Spanish. And she was always with a book. Every time I arrived from the school to my house, I saw my mother <laughs> reading a book uh, in, in the house. And uh, she always uh, demands from ourselves to read, to read, because it's the only way that you can learn is reading, all different things. And uh, yes, I always try to improve myself, and I know, and I still today, uh, I always try to, to know new things, uh, to read about different uh, subjects, and. And one, one was one the, the, of the reasons why I tried to, to learn a lot if someday I decided to, uh, to dedicate my life to football. You, you've made me curious because I know Alex Ferguson very well, his kids, his wife, his brother, because they lived in my city, then I moved to England and I followed their careers. And, but I know he's a little bit like you. He has he's a huge curiosity for history, for books, for documentaries politics, for workers' rights, for cinema. And these are things that you and he really share beyond football. I didn't know about Alex Ferguson about that, but uh, now you, I understand why he was so good manager, why he was the best manager maybe of the world so many years. I think that if you, do, you have your uh, mind open to you know a lot of different things around football, not just football, uh, I don't, I don't think that you can be a good manager. So you need to know language and to read history and to see movies and a lot of different things that when a player see that in front of him is a, is a manager preparing in a lot of different things about not only football, I think that you have more authority. More trust and more, more power of communication. More, most of all, more trust in you and what you, you can help him in a lot of things because the football players, uh, they, they, they don't have just uh, problems inside the pitch. They have also, I think the most difficult thing for a manager is to, to how do you work with the human group. Uh, 25 different personalities that you must try to, to share with them a lot of different experience. 
Uh, I think that that part of the manager is, is more important, or at least the same importance, that what you know about football. I understand and agree. We're going to return to that subject exactly. But we have socios who always support us, who always write questions to us. And we ask them for a couple of questions. And one of them, Chris Brooks, says, Hello, my question for Manuel would be, what to you seemed different about the way that people speak about the game of football in England? He means primarily in the media and press conferences. And what types of questions you would generally be asked in England compared to working in Spain or Argentina or Chile? I think it's an interesting question because it isn't just about the media, it's about what the culture of speaking about football is like. Yes. For me, it's absolutely different, <laughs> but completely different. No, no. Because in England, uh, I just to compare England with Spain. Uh, in Spain, I think that you have the medias absolutely divided. Uh, the media of Madrid uh, and the media of Barcelona, will, uh, they are enemies. <laughs> <laughs> or Valencia, or Sevilla, uh, every media of that city goes with the team. You can see which colors they, they wear, the media. Absolutely, absolutely. And they, they never be uh, with supporting Barcelona against Real Madrid, the media of Madrid or the media of Barcelona. I think that in England you have a media for the whole team. I will for live, every team? Uh, yes, but I live in London, I live in Manchester. And I never read the, the, the news in Manchester against the team of London. They were more objective to see the game, who played better, who played bad. And not always thinking that in London they are doing something to damage the teams of Manchester. Well, a lot of things that is that the culture, the, mind, the mentality is different. That's why I saw, say so many times that the best football may be you play in Spain, but the best league is in England. Uh, about the, the fans, about the pitches, about the media, uh, that I think that they are more, they have more obje objective. Objectivity. Uh, objective about what happened during the game and, nice. and against the team. That for me is the most different. That's nice to hear. Then um, you talked about um, Europe and South America there. And I remember you saying that one of the key things you do is jugar por bandas. But you also said that um, one of the objectives that has helped you succeed is to bring the technical skills of South America, but with the speed of movement, speed of thought, the velocity of a game of Europe, and you've tried to mix them. I wonder if one of the, the great examples of that is the place of Roman Raquelme in the Villarreal team that you had, where so many players were quick to think quick of vision, quick technically. The football was quite um, intense and sent, oh, sempre. the idea was always possible to move forward. But Roman also played at slightly his brilliant quick brain, but he played at slightly his own speed. And Robert Ryan asks us whether there's still a place in today's game for a number 10 like Roman Riquelme. What, what do you think about that as being one of the great blends of your coaching lifetime? Well, because I think that uh, technical plays makes always the difference. You can do a lot of tactical movements, but if the ball does not arrive in exactly the space that you need, all the tactical movements are wrong. So I think that, well, in Villarreal was a mix. I have a, a mixed fielder. That was a pleasure to see them play football because they lost one ball in one month. <laughs> and play there, Roman, Marco Sena, Robert wow. Pires, Santi Casorla, so it was impossible for them to, to, to lose a ball. It was not in their mind. <laughs> and maybe as, uh, when I was a professional football player, I saw all those technical players, how they make the difference in, during the game. I was central back. Uh, my, my strange thing was the tackle, the, the, to, to the heading, the different things, but I always see that the, diff, the technical players make, make the difference. He heading, but... Didn't you also score a very technical headed goal for Universidad against Catolico? Against Colo Colo, I think. And I Colo Colo? Yes, yes. Nice diving yes, header. Because I have, I have a very good jump, I jump very well. Also because I play also basketball, volleyball, football, so I, I had a good, a good uh, timing. To, to but you remind me of one day I went with the Celtic manager to study at Juventus with Lippi. 
and he gave us two, three days. The Celtic manager asked me to fix it, so I came. And we saw the training and the diet, and Lippi sat down like this over dinner in the old Comunale when it was the, the training ground and they were playing at Deli Alpe. And he said to, to Tommy Burns, and to, he said, when I was playing for Sampdoria, more or less the same era as, as you playing in Chile, more or less, he said, I was the libero, which meant I played behind the four oh. players, not libero at all. And the clubs, the coach said to Lippi, he said to me, if, I, if you can even see the halfway line, never mind crossing it, you'll be fined and you'll be dropped. And Lippi said to us that he decided then, as a player, when I'm a coach, attack. And of course he became, he became clever and successful as a coach, yes, but he was, became famous for the tridente for and sure. the pressing and the, the complete reverse of his playing career. He went, no, not like, okay, like this to earn a living as a player, but when I'm a coach, like that. That's similar to what you're saying? Yes, I think so. It's, it's similar. It's, a, it's a, in a way that when you start as a manager, I think that also football is developed. Or maybe the, the football 20 years ago, nothing to... It's not similar to what you play today. It's, it's another football. Now you need more mobility, reduced space, a touch, a play with one or two touch. The, the last third that you must do different things. But the football has changed a lot also. But I continue... Uh, thinking exactly in the same way that when I start this career. The technical players make the difference during the game. Michael Williams sent us, he's one of our socios as well. He said, I've always admired how Manuel has managed to adapt and have success in so many different countries. What would Manuel say that he's learned or take the most experience from? And I wonder if I can direct you to something you've talked about a lot. You've said that you have a very explosive nature yes I whereas that. everybody who watches you from the stands or from the television <laughs> they don't see that they see something very different very calm very organized so which is the real you and why are there why are there two Manuel Pellegrini's the explosive one and then the calm one well for a, <coughs> for a lot of different things first uh, when you are growing you, <laughs> you dominate more yourself <laughs> But when I was a player, yes, I, I, I recognized that I had very bad character. I was always angry, always demanding uh, all the other people what I demand myself. And the people ah. have different personalities. And I, uh, in my career as a manager, I have two different, uh, two different uh, parts of my life. First, the 10 years in Chile, when I started, when I finished my career as, as a player in Chile, I, in 1987. Uh, was my last, uh, 1986 was my last uh, year, uh, year as, as a player. I started a career as a manager, to, went to Lille Shot. To, uh, and I worked in Chile from 1987 till 1996, 96, 98. 98. Was, it not, was it not bad. No, I started first uh, be relegation with my team. <laughs> but it's in the year of Lille Shot. When I went to Lille Shaw... Relegation was, by one goal? By one goal was different, yes, <laughs> different. But not only that, uh, but it uh, was my team. From the 15, play, 15 years that I played the same team. That was uh, also... I learned a lot about that. Uh, but I finished my career after that in Palestino, in O'Higgins, in Universidad Católica. Well, not bad seasons, but I was not happy. Uh, if I wanted to leave my career as engineer for that kind of manager, I don't think that would be good for me. So I understand that I make an improvement as a manager, or it doesn't matter if I continue in that way because it was a medium manager. What didn't you like about the manager you were? In the way I demand all the other players to the, how they must work, how they must play, the uh, mistake that they, that they made, I, as, 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 as I always demand a lot of myself, I demand exactly the same to all the other ones. It, it became... And, and it, in the same way. Uh -huh. And maybe you, I need to shout to you because you don't understand, and maybe with the other, you must be very kind, and so, so there are different ways to, because the personality are different. Well, when I went to Ecuador to start my Broadway career, uh, fortunately for me, I started in 199, the first year that I was in Ecuador. And now, uh, 24 years that I work, the 24 years 
always never stop one year mm. out of my country. Two years in Ecuador, three in Argentina. And when I went to Ecuador, I went uh, alone. I didn't uh, come with your myself, children. my wife and my children. Because my wife is engineer also, she had a very good job in Santiago. My f uh, older son was his first year, he went to the university to study, he's a doctor now. Uh, the second was finished the school. There's a lot of, of things that you trust on your family in the way you, you live. And maybe in Ecuador you have a bad performance as a manager and in two or three months I return to Chile. So I think that I want to take the risk, I will do it alone. And then I had a lot, a lot of hours in that moment to study a lot of different things, not only football, because in that moment I always thought that as you more knew about football, you will be a best manager. And in that year, I, I, well, I studied a lot of different things around football, uh, in the way you must, have, uh, you must talk to different players, the person, like personality, the, emo the intelligent, emotional intelligence, well, a lot of difference to, to improve myself as a chief of a group and not only as a manager. That's why I changed a lot. And one of the things that I read and I, I understand that I had to change was my, my character. So emotional intelligence is about recognizing your, your own moods, recognizing your own reactions, being more effective in how you communicate with different people in your group. Exactly. Not letting energy or anger take over and make you communicate in the wrong way. These types of things? Yes, all those types of things. So what do you do to, I mean, how does, one of the most difficult, now, now we're leaving football aside, one of the most difficult things for a human being to do is to evolve or to change. How, how did you do it? How, how I do it? Well, first that I work in the Ecuador with players, uh, different as Chilean players. So when you are abroad, when you are abroad, it's not the same as your country. Huh? So it was what the first one that I tried to learn in the way they think in Ecuador, the players, Ecuadorian players are not the same as Chilean players. Uh, in that way, I talk a lot of more with the, with the players, with people around football also, with journalists, with, the, with people in the, in the street, uh, uh, to know about the, what, what was football in Ecuador. Uh, and that's why I tried to learn a lot about that. After that was Argentina, that's a, a different, absolutely different country about Ecuador. So, and I, well, I was very successful in that country, in both teams that I work. So uh, I knew that, that that was the current way. When I finished in Ecuador, and I, the, first, the first year in Ecuador, I won the title. And we made a very good uh, international cup, the Copa Libertadores. With, uh, I understand and, uh, that, 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 that that was the... the the way that uh, you must have as, as, a, as a manager. But you've talked about because understanding your players, but in all emotional intelligence, I believe, you, you have to apply a, a self-discipline. You, yes, you have to change the connection between what your brain is saying or your character is saying and what your mouth says. Of course, you need to, you need, you need to change. You must think a, a couple of seconds more before you speak. So your mind must be faster than your mouth. If your mouse is faster and you say before and I think after that, well, you may, be, you may make a lot of mistakes. So That's a very good expression. Your mind must be faster yes, than your yes, mouth. Your mind must be faster than your thought. So uh, maybe I delay my answer or what I think uh, five or six seconds. And when you say one word, when you say a sentence, now you are a slave of that sentence. <laughs> you cannot say, no, I didn't say that. No, yes, you did it. <laughs> You're a slave of the sentence. You've made me feel better about the years um, 2005, 6, 7, when occasionally I would ask you a, a question in the press conference and I would see this face staring back at me. And I would think, oh, fucking hell, I've asked a bad question. <laughs> we're, we're all... I was thinking. Well, <laughs> I think feel much better now. Let me, uh, I wish I, you told me at the time. If I under, <laughs> no, that was different for me to tell you at that moment. But of course, in all, in all the press conference, I listen exactly what they are asking to me, and I try to think about a couple of seconds before I start. Uh, I start answering. That's controlling the, the mind. What, what about controlling? If you're explosive, if not just you, if one is explosive, what about controlling anger? That's more difficult. Yes, it's more difficult, but I think that you must not always control your anger. In that moment, I think it's good for the player to see inside the dressing room, not to the media, that you are not happy with what they were doing. I have a lot of 
big problems with different players inside the inside the dressing room. But to the media, I think that you must be different. And to the players, they know that one day maybe you have an explosive uh, thing about one uh, thing that they do. But another day you are with good mood and you are talking with them that they are doing well. How, do you, how did you cope then or now? Because I want to move to Malaga now. How did you cope then or now <laughs> with... Um, those ridiculous well, moments. That's why when they asked me, what about the VAR? V -A -R? <laughs> I saw you said. I absolutely support <laughs> for the VAR because the, the mistake, the big mistakes, not the, the criterial mistake, and maybe you think it's foul, and maybe I do think it's not foul, but, but those kinds of things now, in the modern football from today, is impossible to do it. So we're talking about almost 10 years to the day, in about... A fortnight, it will be exactly 10 years since playing against Jurgen Klopp's um, Borussia Dortmund to it's unbelievable. When I really the, ridiculous. You go through that, that's not a mistake because it was in a free kick. So the lineman was in the correct line because in the mo in movement, maybe the lineman was two or three meters. He can you can actually right. see in the, in the photo I've taken, you can Just see the lineman standing kick, in line with it the. It was a free kick because uh, we're not standing there, we are waiting. For the player for a moment to put the ball inside the, the, the inside the, our pit, inside our box, and we wait in the last minute when the player right to the ball, we go in, huh? and the players for Borussia Dortmund went in four or five before minimum and, and four. The photograph is clear. And then when when <coughs> Santana scores, Scheiber is touching yes, the ball yes. when well, well, Santana well, well, yes, is on well, is on the goal line. I believe. It. So it's ridiculous. I'm very sad to say that in today in football from today. That's it's impossible. It's impossible. But I'm very sad to say that they were Scottish officials, so on behalf of the country. Yes, that's a good Sorry. <laughs> but how did you cope then and, and how do you look back at it? I mean, for you now, is, is it just gone? Bye bye? No pain? Then how did you cope? Well, in that moment, I suffer a lot with all the players. <laughs> we, we arrived to Malaga at three or four o'clock in the morning and there were 3,000 people or 4,000 people in the airport waiting for us. I think that. Most of that you can you can't do it anymore. We suffer a lot. We we miss an uh, an opportunity that maybe, but well, not maybe. Malaga will never have it again. Uh, and what, what more you can do? Cope. That's what I mean about emotional intelligence. I yes, suppose that's right. that was a big moment to to learn more to use it. Of course, I think with more experience, you always will learn more if you want. If you think that because you have a lot of years as a manager that you don't need to learn anymore, I think that you're being a, you are doing a big mistake. I think that every day you must learn something. With my age, with 40 years, with 30 years, and that's I consider always. You, you, I, I'm, now, I'm not going to take a risk, but I'm going to mention something that maybe isn't too much fun for you, but you made me laugh when? in October maybe. I was reading Grazetta. And uh, Betis were going to play against Mourinho's Roma. And somebody asked you about when you left Madrid and went to Malaga, a Malaga team which played beautifully, which did historic things, which was fun to watch. And whoever was asking you the question asked you about Mourinho's comment about when I leave Madrid, I'll never go to Malaga, which was a, a comment which, in my opinion, was very theatrical, very divisive, and not showing much emotional intelligence. And you said, oh, well, now he's gone to Roma and maybe he's learned some maturity. <laughs> and I don't think you used the word, but I think I heard the phrase, maybe he's learned some humility. or so. I, I thought that was a nicely timed reply. I would say that Mourinho, in my opinion, is not the perfect example of emotional intelligence. Fair? Well, I don't want to talk about Mourinho. I can talk to you it's about what you said that made me laugh. why I decide to go to Malaga in that moment, because my life was always from challenge, uh -huh. from different challenge. Not to go to the best club, just as I win the title and that I'm happy with that. No, I, all my life, always, uh, I have been different challenge. Unfortunately for, unfortunately for me, I, lot, I won a lot of those challenges. Mm -hmm. So when uh, Mourinho went to Rome, I think that was maybe something similar. So I went to Rome, to do it better than they had doing all the years before, and he's doing very well. But maybe 
Mourinho's mentality in this moment, I am absolutely sure that it's different than 10 years ago. So maybe he's mature also himself. You would hope so. And again, on the, on the subject of emotional intelligence, you've said in interviews that despite... I remember being on the last day of the season when you were Madrid coach, I was in the press conference from Guardiola, where before he celebrated, the first thing he said was, I want to thank Manuel Pellegrini and Real Madrid for the challenge, for the football they've played. It wouldn't be possible to play like this if it wasn't for them, which I thought was extremely... Um, that was to the benefit, that was to the good name of sport, to be able to say that. So it was, a, it, was a, it, was a very, it was a successful year in ways, and not so in other ways, but you've talked about looking back and thinking that you wish you'd handled your upward communication with Florentino Perez differently. Is, is that, am I right that, you, that that's how you think about the process of, because a manager has to manage upwards too? Yes, of course. Well, uh, first of all, I think that was a so special season that there's a lot of things that maybe if, if I can do it again, maybe I, I will change it, some things. Uh, one of the relations things, of course, is the, with Florentino Perez, but it was not the best. At the first, uh, when, I be, uh, when I began working in Real Madrid in the pre-season to have the squad that I wanted for the year, maybe have some different. Too many years ago, so it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't matter. But I think that uh, for you as a manager to have 96 points with a team and not to win the title is, is it's so difficult to, to repeat. Uh, but Barcelona played very well also. They had a very good team. So I dis I absolutely sure that they deserve also to win the title. But for me, to when you arrive to Real Madrid, you just maybe you have one option in your life. So I would like to continue in Real Madrid. Uh, yeah. But for maybe for the relation that were not a good relation, I couldn't do it. Was it a simple clash of strong characters? Is, is it that easy to say that that's... No, I don't think that's a strong character. I think that it's, it, it depends what the president thinks that the manager is and what the manager thinks how he must work with the president. That's different. Different. It's not wrong. The, no? It's not wrong. I am not wrong. There are different ways. And I always say that moment. When you don't think exactly the same that the president of the club, the man that must lead that club is the manager, not the president. So I leave uh, Real Madrid, I, I repeat, with a lot of pain because uh, I wanted to continue to, to repeat uh, maybe that season. But I always say that if I, if I continue in Real Madrid, I never, never uh, will go to Malaga, to Malaga. And for me, the three years that I lived in Malaga was maybe if not the best three years of my career, very near to be. Because something beautiful happened, the passion of the fans, all historic all. achievements for Malaga. Uh, a beautiful city football. where you like to live. Uh, I was very, I'm very happy here now in Sevilla also. The three years that I live in Manchester were beautiful for me. We, we, we won the, the Premier League. But uh, Malaga had in that moment all. Because uh, it was a challenge for me to have a, a small club, to put it in the in the, the Champions League. After that, because I have my house there, I bought a house and I always go to Malaga. So there's a lot of things, different things that maybe they compense a little what I lost living in Real Madrid. It's compensation. Madrid. One thing, before we run out of time, one thing that's important to talk about is, is life in Sevilla, working for Betis. I'm a man who links the two clubs, Malaga and Betis, isn't just you, it's, it's Joaquin, who's... Um, Extraordinary, is that a fair word to say? Yes, absolutely. Fair as word. a player and as a guy, as a player, as a person. Is he one of the funniest guys you've met in football? Maybe also. Maybe, maybe the funniest. Maybe. What? Um, uh, one of the best players, maybe uh, also. I, know. I think that because for his character, his character, he didn't uh, do, do it better. He did a good career, but with the, his conditions, maybe if he wanted to go to England, and he didn't want to go to England. He wants to stay here because he likes this type of life. But uh, Mourinho went to him from Chelsea. To Chelsea, a lot yeah. Of time. It came quite and, close. And if uh, Joaquin was 21 years old, he go to England, to Chelsea, to that Chelsea, well, maybe he would be twice what he did as a player. That's a big statement. Both he and you share something because you believe, I think, that 
there's a there's the age that it says on your passport or your birth certificate and the age that you are because of how you live. That's I, is that how true? I live and how I demand myself also. Okay. It's more to demand yourself. It's, it's difficult to demand yourself because you always want to add, but for what? I had this age. What, what, what I what I. Do you have a voice in your head saying, relax, it's no. okay. Today I'm starting my career. Every day? Every day. Every day I started my career and I work and, and me also. So I try to play tennis once a week, golf once a week, go to the gym to two or two, one or two times also in the, during the week. Uh, swimming, uh, where I try to make sports always, to try to keep my, my body in the way I want to do it. And that affects how you are mentally? Yes, of course, absolutely. But like, do you, do you really manage that every day, the, to start every day as if it was your last day on earth? Is, is, can you manage First, that? Uh, I try to. It's not, it's not easy, it's not easy. I always have my sentence of my father that he said, if you do today what you did yesterday, it's impossible to be old in one day. <laughs> but the difficulty is to do it. <laughs> so I remind myself not only my body, it's also in my mind and uh, what we were talking before in, in reading, into new, to try to learn different language. To uh, test yourself? Yes, always. And Joaquin isn't the same identical, but to be playing top football at his age, for example, you, you played him at Old Trafford in a huge game, a demanding fast game. He still he's got he has to score one goal more to be the oldest player ever to score in the Primera. Um, I know he's been given an extraordinary physique, but does he? Am I right in thinking does he live and live football in the same way as you to 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 push himself and to challenge himself? Because not many pl players stay at elite level at, at 40, 41. No, no, of course not. It's more difficult also because uh, I'm not fighting for, for with managers inside the pitch who do it better. Joaquin is fighting against players of 20 years old or 21 years old, so that has a double merit for him to try to, to, to do it in the way he, he do it from today. Uh, but uh, maybe he works more in football than people think, uh, because they always see him in TV or doing, or doing different uh, works. But when he's here on the pitch, he works the two, the two hours and he demands a lot of himself. Mm -hmm. Then maybe the way to wrap it up is this. Uh, when you lifted the cup for Betis um, in the Olympic Stadium, Cartuja, did, does it make you even more determined to, find, to win more trophies in your career? Because there's a satisfaction in demanding of yourself, making a fan base happy. You, you deliberately, all through your career, you try to win but play spectacular football. But when you lift a trophy, I expect it... it Makes you it's go, different. Of course, it's different. Give me more. Yes, of course. Well, but I have uh, twelve trophies in my career. <laughs> it's not bad. I'm not, I'm not saying. <laughs> I'm not saying it's not enough. No. I'm trying to think about no. tomorrow. It depends on where you are. Of course, if you are in uh, Real Madrid, uh, I need to to win a trophy. Yeah. That's why I couldn't continue because I didn't win a trophy. That's different. I'm talking that's about Manuel Pellegrini. But, no, no, I'm talking about where you are. Yeah. For me, when I was five years in Villarreal, to play. Semi-final of Champions League, quarter-final of Champions League, to be second in the league, third in the league, to win a quarter, to arrive to quarter of UEFA, to win the Tep Toto. I'm talking about Villarreal 20 years ago, not the Villarreal from today. Maybe that is more successful for you than to win a title with Barcelona, Real Madrid, that they always win. Mm -hmm. with, different, with different managers, they always win titles. With different managers, or for me as a manager, Villarreal was the best Villarreal of the history, Betty is the best of the history, Mali is the best of the history, San Lorenzo is the best of the history. And I won a title with San Lorenzo, and of course I wanted to, uh, especially to see the react of the people here in Betis, when Betis, after 17 years old, won a title, the trophy, a title. Of course I want to repeat. <laughs> but you must, you have a reality, it's not, it's not easy to do it. And what, what, if you have never been with Betis, three times in Europe in a row, if you do it, it's because you did something different. Because nobody will do it before. So that is for me exactly, it, exactly for me, this, I enjoy the same way to have a title in Manchester City, that you normally have to win a title, or in Real Madrid, or in Real Plate that I won a title in Argentina. For me, I enjoy 
exactly the same that when I arrived with uh, Villarreal to semi-final, we were able to win the cup with Betis, what I did in Malaga. Well, for me, it's exactly the same for me. I don't need to, to demonstrate all the people, see, I had 30, 30 times, but yeah, but in what clubs? That's important also. Then the, the last thing I have to say to you is, I hope I live and I work in Spain. So I hope that I see you coaching Betis for five more years, six more years. I don't care. In football, you never know. Is there room, if, if you're not at Betis for one reason or another, is there room in your mind and your spirit of adventure to go back to the Premier League in England one more time? I'm keeping my fingers crossed that you're, you're with Betis for five more years <laughs> lifting trophies. But in terms of your adventurous Rome, your kind of love affair with England, is there a room, is there a possibility that maybe one more time in England sometime? Of course, if I have the option when I finish Betis, with my contract with Betis, if I have the option, of course I will be always to return to the Premier League, to, to return to the Premier League, an important option. I like the Premier League, I like the way the England, uh, all the fans in England live the football. So there's a lot, of, I, more, I'm very happy here in Spain. More than here? This is what I, when I hear South America or Spanish different. people talking about England, sometimes I don't understand it. I, the British football culture educated me, made me. But if you live with the Betis fans, you can't say, oh, the fans in England, because no, no, in my no, opinion, no. it's I more that, here. I think there's a difference. I not compare one fans with the other one. That's why I, I, I told you I'm very happy here. Yeah. I have also the, the lucky thing in my career to, to manage in Argentina. And you know how the fans are in Argentina. <laughs> uh, here in Spain, the fans are also very important. In England, but I, uh, I like both things. That's why I always say, I have, I have the option to continue in Betis. And here, all the things in Betis are going in the, in the, in the straight, in the, the correct way. Of course, I continue here. That's why I have a contract two years more. I, I'm not trying to leave Betis no. to return to the That's Premier League. Completely That's completely clear. clear. But if I finish here in Betis, hypothetically, and I have a good option. A good option, not to any, any in the club that I have the option to go to work there. I like that club. Maybe it's an important option. That maybe, uh, maybe as I as always said, as my national team also. Yeah. If I, I like, I, I would like to be in the, the manager of Chile in my national team. But I always say the same thing. I prefer to have to manage a club because I like to be all the all the days of the week working on the pitch. And the national team, you can do it. Before you came in, we opened the door just to smell the grass, which is being cut today. And even just smelling the grass on the training ground. Of is, course. But is, if I don't have that option, uh, I go to the national team of Chile. National Not team. because it's behind that, because I like to work the week, uh, daily in the pitch every day. Beautifully understood. <laughs> Nobody listening to this. I have to stop now because we promised at one o'clock we would stop. So it's we will stop. Yes, so the one thing I'll say is when hypothetically the contract with Betis is ended, and England is calling. Alex Ferguson and I will persuade you maybe to think about Aberdeen <laughs> instead. And that's the proper way to close this interview. Don Manuel. Thanks very much. for Thank your you very video. much. Enjoyed that a lot. Yeah, Thanks for explaining your life to us.